So I just want to thank all of you for choosing this session. My name is Brent Moody. I'm Global Director of Design Technology at IBI Group, also an architect. And I always have just been playing, playing BIM for decades. So that's um, what I'm going to show you today is just the experiences that I've had at IBI Group and how we're weaving design automation into every facet of what we're doing. And I'll show you examples from the user end straight through to the implementation of our asset management system and a couple things in between. So feel free if there's questions, just uh, you know, blurt them out, it's all good. Uh, I just wanna start with this slide. My, my CEO presents this a lot and it's his portrayal of the vast exponential change that's occurring in our industry today. So, you know, when, when we talk about BIM, I like to step aside from the traditional, you know, what is BIM, what software processes, workflows, execution planning, all that is required and all that is there. But it's all being greatly impacted by what you're seeing here. We went over about 50 years of steady change, minimal growth, a little bit of change. And then all of a sudden, in the last 10 years, all of these things appeared. And for me, the, the power of what we have, the potential of today looking into tomorrow is, is, is amazing for me. So if you're familiar with all of these, great, very quickly, just imagine, you know, I'll start with, you point at any object in the physical space, it's been digitized, you wanna see information. Through augmented reality or some form of virtual reality, you're faced with that information. It's purpose fit for you. Taken from the big data pool of information, brought down for yourself. Big data is empowered from the cloud. It's there and it's accessible. 5G brings the speed to our fingertips. Um, HD movies, what are they saying? 30 seconds or 10 seconds instead of uh, five, 10 minutes. That speed of information flow is on the verge of making a breakthrough into our continent and into the devices within which we carry. Um, with that comes the world of blockchain, securing that information so you understand what's happened to it, when and by whom. So there's that digital record of the exchange of data. Quantum computing, computing empower, empowered by the cloud through software as a service. Kind of touches all of the aspects there. And then the last one, robotic processes, RPA, robotic process automation. The ability to take what we do automate it, build bots, deploy them, um, and remove the need to focus on the mundane. That's life. And that's the life either we're partially in right now or we're about to leap into very quickly in the coming months and years. So at IBI, we, we look at how we build this link between the physical and the virtual. So the new overused word is the digital twin, and that's awesome, it is what it is, a virtual representation of the physical, uh, the physical state of being. And we look at that front end to the back end, starting with planning and design through the implementation of parametric analyses, through the design and construction world, doing things with the digital twin. And I just say it simply like that, because there's no right or wrong BIM. There's no too much or too little. It's all depend, it all depends on how it's scoped, scheduled, and budgeted, what makes sense throughout the life cycle of any one particular project, and how it's then purpose fit to meet personal goals, corporate goals, and then the actual overall goals of the stakeholders, of humanity, of the people that interact with the assets within which we build. And to that point, we have a fully deployed smart city platform coupled with an asset management system that fuses that data together, which I'll get to at the end of the presentation. So a good different view, same concept, that never ending line of data. There's so many diagrams like this, it doesn't matter, but you know, you do conceptual design, it goes through the development of this digital twin, the development of the BIM, from the BIM you do stuff with it, you immerse. And when I say virtual and augmented reality, for me, it's all about experiential immersion. Um, and you know, I'll show a couple examples, but it's about giving that feeling, that understanding, not only of designs in space, but also of information. So imagine being immersed in data and what does that actually mean? And then bleeding into that synergy of data throughout its life cycle and into asset management. I'll describe, I always say, if you look at the lights up here and I ask you run to Home Depot or Lowe's or something and get me the, a bulb replacement for those lights. Can you look up, run and go do it? There's so much data from that. 
Now you might look and say, are they fluorescent? Are they this type of bulb, et cetera? But why can't I point my phone, tap into that pool of data, see the fixture, see how it was designed, the shop drawing, the warranty, all that good stuff. What type of light it is? What type of power consumption is it? Click a button, have it delivered through the digital economy. Maybe it's drone delivered and we replace it while I'm still talking. But also while I'm looking at that light, why can't I understand what's the metrics for it? How is it performing and behaving? Do the lights last? Is it a 10,000 hour light bulb that's only lasted 2,000 hours? And did the last light bulb not last its life cycle. So is there a problem? Maybe there's extra energy current. Maybe there's a problem with the grid and the network and we're getting surges and the ballast and whatever it is. All that data is there to the point where I look at that light bulb and say, should I actually replace it or should I think about replacing the fixture? What's the cost of continual light bulb replacements for the next 10, 15, 20 years versus a brand new fixture now in a different light bulb? And all of that, I should be able to point my phone at the asset and see all that data. And that's how it should be. And we're not there yet, but that's the world where we're going to. Sometimes people say, well, it's very sci-fi, it's very whatever, but why not? We all know where that data is. Sorry, let me rephrase that. We all know that data exists and where it could be, it's just not where it's supposed to be right now. So when we say, what do we bring to the table? It's all of that. We want to try to better the communities for the users and the stakeholders by bringing betterment through the interaction, manipulation, and immersion of information. So planning, design, construct, operate, um, very common. We all know those phases. Our focus has been how to build a, create an operation and maintenance regime through systems that we develop that we can then tie back to the information that we built during planning and design while engaging the user and the smooth movement of data. And that's the continuum that IBI Group has been focusing on, harnessing BIM as a data source along with all the other data sources that we have. So BIM, this has been my BIM slide for decades. Multidiscipline BIM, we all know this. All your discipline, the previous talk I was in was talking about, and I hate using Revit as the, um, as the indicator of what BIM is, but Revit was designed as the single big BIM, the single big central model, put all your eggs in the basket. Bentley was not, Graphisoft was different, Vectorworks is different, digital projects, et cetera, but it's all conceptually, you end up with this, you slice it up, you do your materials, you do your interferences, you generate your drawings, this is BIM, this is 20 years old or more, but this is BIM. And whenever I get into the disputes of, oh, should we BIM, shouldn't we BIM? It's, my goodness, doing this just for the sake of design, I can't imagine opening up AutoCAD or MicroStation, a 2D CAD application, and trying to do a project. I don't even think I would know how to do that anymore because I'm dependent on the fact that all of this stuff comes together. Right? And notice how I keep saying AutoCAD, MicroStation, Revit. It's not all about one specific piece of software. It's about all this stuff. This is all BIM. These are all projects that I've worked on in my career. And I love that middle image there because that's just a disaster of information. It was a, um, a uh, power treatment plant, a, a power plant that included partial chemical treatment down in the States. And we were bimming telephone jacks and all these insane assets because that's what the client wanted. And you know what? We could. It's all good. It wasn't all in one model because if that was all in one model, it would be an unworkable model. It was everywhere. I also like this guy right here. This is a bus rapid transit project, nine kilometers of buried utility, trees, um, landscape bulbs, root bulbs, finding interferences between potential growth of trees and proposed pipes. It's great. And it's as much BIM as my walls and floors if I put my architect hat on. So this is our world. So when I look at this and I say, this is where we are. We are tied to the machine, right? There's no way I can do a project with a pencil and, pen with a pencil and paper anymore. I know that. And I don't think I ever could. And my father shakes his head at me, but it's all good. We're tied to the machine. So because of this, one of the challenges that I've been given is how do I bring automations and efficiencies at, to every level of everything I just said? So we said, okay, let's, let's do this. 
And IBI Group, so I didn't do any IBI plug here. So IBI stands for Intelligence Buildings and Infrastructure. Buildings are our vertical projects, infrastructure all the horizontal. And intelligence is a sector, it's about 20% of our revenue that just focuses on data manipulation. It's where our asset management system comes from, our smart city platform. And it's all about the infusion of data for whatever defines purpose, whatever scope we have. So when I, when I came along, I was came with BIM and stressing the I of BIM. It's not about the model, it's about the information. That's what broken record for years. And the CEO said, okay, great. So let's focus on this technology. And Brent, you're gonna lead the creation of efficiencies for users. And I said, okay, fine. And that's part of our technology mission. So I said, let me start with the general user. So from a design technology perspective, I said, what are the things I can do that help people. Notice I have the Revit modeler. So as quickly as I say, BIM is not Revit and Revit is not BIM, but 50% of our revenue is buildings and our preferred buildings piece of software is Revit. So we do user. So I needed efficiencies for them too. But from the general user, the first thing we said was, let's look at how we load software. So I come into IBI and I used to work at Seeds to a Mill and I would say, we're gonna do all this stuff. And they'll say, yeah, but we can't even open AutoCAD. We can't even open Revit. Ugh, really? Why can't you open it? So we built a loader and we said, what are all the things that irk us when people load Revit? So selecting templates, libraries, um, discipline designations, shared parameter files, connecting to a Revit server, all of these little goodies. So maybe when you go file options and you're supposed to fill out the right stuff and everything, Guess what? You tell 10 people to do one thing, they'll do in 10, there'll be 10 different ways it's done, right? So we have all of this stuff. Set your accelerator, pick your Revit servers. When I hit save and go, it writes all of this to the INI for both Revit and the Revit server, and it does it consistently. So all the person has to do is use the loader, and that's it. So we wrote this because from an efficiency perspective, we were wasting time and wasting money, fretting over all of this. So I couldn't do what I feel are the more important things that actually have an impact to society and information and all the stuff I described with the light because I have to go around to people telling them how to go start, have it, go here, go here. It's mind numbing. So we built the loader. We then said, well, all right, we have AutoCAD work. So AutoCAD, unfortunately, doesn't go away, the concept of 2D work. So the same thing, profiles, versions, synchronizing of files. I've had people say to me, Brent, your BIM stuff doesn't work because when I press hatch in AutoCAD, it's slow. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this has no connection to anything, but let me solve that. So we built an app, synchronizes some things, it brings down your patterns and your fonts, it writes to the registry the profiles that you need, you make your selections, pick your office, it sees the pen tables, done. And it's all based on coding the registry, identifying what it needs, putting an app in front of it, and just telling them to just get on with it. All this goes away. Then we said, great, same thing, Civil 3D, right? We said, well, we do, now that we did the AutoCAD part, this is our infrastructure. So Civil 3D, this is that project, the piping and the utilities and all that good stuff. I want to focus on setting data shortcuts and making sure people are defining information properly across the Civil 3D project, not where is my pen table? My goodness, just select it. So same concept, same technology. There was the big thing about the civil 3D workspaces and how they're all great. And once we silenced that, all of a sudden it was, okay, so now we can talk about modeled data. I said, yes, let's talk about modeled data. How are you doing the pipe networks? What are you gonna to define to that information? And it erases that. Is anybody here familiar with Bentley and the Bentley applications? Okay, there's a couple, uh, awesome. A little, you know, I did a lot of work on my career with Bentley, so it was the same concept, this is the last loader. Um, the thing with Bentley is, if you do a lot of linear projects for major um, organizations, they come with a ton of standards. And they just give them to you and say, here, use this. And what this does is by selecting the standard, the version, etc., it does all the things that follow, here, use my standard. So it takes it, it puts files in the right spot, it configures something on the user's machine so that when I select my app and when I launch it, 
If I know I'm doing, so these ones here, these are their civil applications, geopack and inroads and open roads, it's all configured. I just have to go to my BIM lead, or me, I guess, and I ask, get the question asked, what am I supposed to do on this project? Use this software, this setup, and run with it. Now let's talk about what you're modeling and what you're doing. Not where do I put this file and what's the board? Just, it's, it's there. You just do it. So automations. So I'll, I'll be done with general user soon, but the, the beauty about these general user ones is they touch everybody. I don't have to go through, well, I don't know this, I don't know. You're using the application, use it. Speaking of applications, I would get out, how, how many times did you have to have the dialogue about what version of Revit are you on? Are you on 2018.2 or 0.3 or 0.36? Oh my goodness. Well, okay, let's start with pull up the dialogue and tell me what version you're on. And we say, that's the version we want. And the other one is the version installed. If you don't have it, click a button and say, I need help. Sends the email, gives me all the particulars of what has to be installed, done. And I don't want to hear it. And then if you don't have the right thing, you're going to get the right thing. And then when we run this checker, it'll be good. Because it was mind numbing. I remember when I started at IBI, we were on the 20, I guess it was 2014 still at the time. And I, the, the, the lectures I received about 2014 point whatever versus the other point whatever, I'm like, guys, it's Revit, man. It's not supposed to be that complicated, right? Uh, the other one we built in is a drive cleaner. Everything's slow, BIM slow, BIM sucks. All right, why? So you pull up, we built this little cleaner. Oh, you got no room on your hard drive. Your user folder, empty your user folder. I don't know how. Okay, empty your local Revit copies. I don't know how. So now you just do it. Click and it's done. And it'll go, it deletes everything. It's, it's just like if you do it manually, it can't delete it all. But uh, these little things. And, and the selling point to the CEO is um, they're saving clicks. For you to go and path to every single one of those, first you got to know where to path to. And ever since Windows moved around the user profiles, telling someone to empty their temp folder it just doesn't happen. So we said, okay, great, little mini win. The other one is map drives, and I hate map drives. You know, I want to use cloud-hosted systems, BIM 360. It's the way to go, and you're on Autodesk project-wise. If you're on Bentley, combination of both, Office 365. But we have projects. Again, you know, they're just on the local drive. They're studies, whatever it is. So I'm working in Edmonton. I'm sitting in Toronto. I need to quickly hit Edmonton. I just want to quickly map the drive. They say, go to my drive and work on this project and do something for a day. That's it. And then I can't go into them and say, let's incur the cost of BIM 360. No, that's not going to happen. So the, this was huge for us, just to, to squash that. People don't know. They don't understand how servers are set up. That's all IT. This is just do it. Click and do. Quick and easy. Then we'll jump into Revit now. So those were general. I have a, I have a whole bunch of other ones. And what I do for the CEO is I actually track their usage and I say, look, so many times they're used. Every time a user clicks those things, we actually receive a signal, goes up to one of our, our cloud SQL databases, and we know when you used it and why. And it's not big brother, it's just validating what we're doing. And once we have that, I can portray back to the CEO, this is the benefit of what we've built and how often it's being used. Same with all of these tools. So some of these now, when, when I pull some of these up, some might be available in um, purchase software like CTC or um, Excel to Revit or things of that nature. But you know, there's, there's a value and cost balance here. So this first, this level creator, we looked and we said, okay, so how much time do people spend setting up a project and just creating all the levels? So it helps that I have a guy that can code this stuff and very quickly, boom, done, right? Live, there's all my levels created. Period. And you know, when we describe this one, obviously there's the benefit. If I'm gonna do it one by one, right click new, right click new, enter parameters, whatever it is, it takes time. When there, if there's somebody says to me, well, you could buy X and it's available, then there's the balance of how much time did it take my guy to build that versus the procurement of something and the deployment of it globally, et cetera. So we're looking at how many of these make sense. The other one, the sheet set creator, 
on major projects. I've got pr project managers, design managers, multi-partners, um, multiple entities, building spreadsheets of lists of uh, spreadsheets of lists of sheets. So he said, all right, we'll pull this stuff in, be able to read a spreadsheet, identify what we need, and then have Revit spit out the creation of those sheets for me. And this allows the project management team going through whatever effort they do, and, I, and I, I've been involved in this, the, the dialogue over how many sheets and what they should be called, it's all good. My view is, can you just make the decision? Tell us what you need. Once they tell us what's needed, we just jam it straight into the system and off they go. Uh, another, as you can see how, what these are like, it's the removal of the mundane. Phase creator, the concept here was to very quickly create the phase views, looking at, thinking of new existing demo not in contract as our standard, most common phases when we're doing design. Uh, just quite simply allows us to just select the phase we need and blitz it out. Based on the amount of levels we built with the level creator, it now allows me to generate those for the phase creator. So very simple. There was others there that, that we could show. We have one called a CAD finder. So every time the Revit central model dies because of a really bad LinkedIn CAD file, well, we use CAD finder, shows us all the linked CAD. We could jump to each one, purge what we don't like. Simple things like that, just to get those automations. And again, I'm building, right? I've got to get rid of these, and I don't want to call them low level, but I want to call them these common items that touch the most people, that touch the individuals, that make the information that I want to take to do more things with. If they're struggling and focusing on making levels and phases and what's the name of the sheet and oh, I named the sheets wrong, I don't know what to do, and my model is slow, I'm not going to get the good stuff I want. I'm going to get dialogue about sheets, and I don't like that. Looking at the design professional, uh, first thing we said was, hey, architects, do you realize how much time you waste with an area spreadsheet? And they would look at us and say, well, what do you mean? This is what we have to do. This is what we did for decades and centuries. So this is just out of the box, Rabbit. This is like, look, guys, gals, we can make a, we could make a schedule. And because we have spaces, we can get all of this. We can do area ratios, validate condos, livable versus service, just meet all of the requirements. There's provincial requirements, federal requirements, depending on who the client is. This just comes out of the model. And I, and, and I have to sell this because the time that's wasted not automating simple things like this, not using the model for the purpose that it is. Now, how do I make that work? Whoever's modeling better be using spaces correctly. So that's my focus of making sure that room spaces are developed and understood and implemented properly so that I can do this. So that I don't have an architect say to me, oh, I tried it and it just doesn't work. I did it manually and the manual one, done. all of that goes away when this stuff is done correctly. So, cause we're not fretting over the other stuff. And then room data sheets. I'm not sure if anybody has that as a required deliverable, but a lot of healthcare projects require a data sheet per room. Um, in the UK, they're called C sheets. And this is a Dynamo script we built where we just said, let's, find, let's identify a parameter. So here we have six rooms that need room data sheets. Four clicks of a button, I get all of my plans and elevations. So the room data sheet will have the plan and the four elevations. Second click of the button will give me the 3D views. And again, this is all live real time. Third click will give me my schedule. So this is any asset or component that's within the room. And then the last click will create my sheet for me. And we were apparently getting outbid on projects in the UK because they kept saying, people are coming in saying they can do the room data sheets very quickly, we need to do something. So this is your room data sheet. Obviously, there's no assets in the room, but that's exactly what it would do. And then this is my deliverable. And it just blitzes it out for all of the rooms that are identified as requiring it. Now, the benefit of this, when you, uh, I, um, I heard mention of Darufus earlier today. Uh, so you use a tool like Darufus or Codebook or anything that focuses on, focuses on room and space management, that data comes into this model, placing required asset needs in each space, and then that, that data gets represented on the room data sheet. So now there's a continuum between what comes in from those types of systems, what's placed in the model, and then the portrayal of that as a potential deliverable um, out the door. 
Again, automation. Dynamo, if uh, you know, I'm not an expert at Dynamo by any means. I'm more, hey, can't we get Dynamo to do this, this, and this? And geniuses go and say, yeah, Brent, have a look at this. Man, that's good stuff. So it, it's so powerful what it can do to the Revit model. Now, of course, we can't get away from CAD. I want a world where I don't have to deliver a drawing, let alone a CAD file. I want to just deliver my model. I want to deliver the information as a whole. But we're not there yet. So this was an example from our Tel Aviv Redline project. We had to build a checker because they kept refusing our deliverables. So what this is showing is you'll have standards for a model file and a sheet file. So we've got to check level layers. You've got to check title block information. So in this project, we had project name as well as, sorry, project name and everything in both English and Hebrew. So can you imagine how many times the Hebrew version was keyed in correctly in AutoCAD? So they would take out of Revit, get into AutoCAD, do all these things, we deliver it and nothing works. So what we did is we built a checker with the help of SolidCAD. And basically when, when it comes up here, sorry, I talk faster than the video. So it asks, where are the things you want me to check? So in theory, I've got Revit, I've exported everything to DWG and I'm about to deliver this thing. And I've got to tell it, here's where my standard standards are, check against this model file, check against this sheet file, check against the spreadsheet for what should be in title blocks and give me a report. And then we just tell it to have some fun and it'll go and open every single file very quickly, check it. So just imagine click savings here, time savings. If I had to do this all manually and actually check it for real and then actually really report on it, which I would never want to do. But somebody does this on the client's end and then somebody says, we're not paying you. And then somebody says, like, what, why, what, what did we do now, right? So it generates this and green is good, red is bad. Everything that's red, we got to go and fix. I want it all to be green as a quality reviewer on a deliverable. It's all got to be green until we deliver. It could be Revit export settings. It could be how something that was done inside Revit itself. It could be some bonehead moves that were done in AutoCAD before they were getting ready to deliver. I don't know. But this is just a way to check and validate. So at the end of the day, we get that check. Uh, structural parametrics. Our structural team actually took Dynamo and said, you know, we can do a lot more. They said, Brent, can you go scrape the building code for these certain things? So we, we, we wrote a little bot that pulls building code data out specific to what they want. And then they just basically built a, a, a routine that will, based on design criteria that they plug in, will spit them out a model. And you know, we use this, think from zero to 30% of design. Like if my structural engineer sent me this as an architect, I'd be very happy. Hold on. One second, this, this. Doesn't look like much, but there you go. Proper Revit components, proper, um, the minimal required um, selections for columns and beams so that I can then proceed. And of course it's dynamic. So if they adjusted and changed the parameters, it would adjust and, uh, and appear accordingly. So, you know, with that, again, we're talking about speed of delivery, speed of, um, efficiency too, and just the ability to have something true as early in the project as possible so that when we're trying to achieve something, when we're trying to, you know, propel BIM beyond just I'm BIMing for the sake of making my drawings, we're not fretting over trying to get proper and true data. This can be structurally analyzed right away. This can go straight to an analysis tool. It's got all the information that it needs in order to, to properly facilitate an early level analysis. Okay, I'm gonna shift over to our BIM bot. And this, the concept of the bot continues um, through a robotic process automation. So just a little precursor to this. Our CEO went to our finance department, finance and HR, and just said, hey, we spend a lot of money on overhead, automate stuff. So using tools like UiPath and Microsoft's bot framework, We've built robotic processes that basically work 24 seven. An example that we did on the finance side, um, uh, every day in our timesheet system, they have to update the um, exchange rates. 
So if I plug in an expense report or some project data and I'm in Canada working on a project in the States or in the UK working whatever, the, it, it rationalizes the dollar based on the exchange rate. So they were doing it initially, one person would spend a day doing it every week. Now a bot does it every single night. It takes, it, I don't know, seconds to grab all the rates, to plug it into the finance system. And every single day we have clear and accurate exchange rates. In the finance world, that's a great thing. As an architect, I said, yay, that's great. But that's an example of bots, right? So from our perspective, we said, well, what can we do? So using similar technology, um, we, we started to look at this concept of a BIM bot. And we said, what, what's a problem that needs some form of automation? And let's say, we said, let's look at clash mitigation. So the world of clash detection, it's awesome. Right? We're all modeling one Revit, 10 Revits. You might have a civil 3D. You better have civil 3D or something because your building doesn't float. So you have your building models. You have your civil model, probably multiple platforms. You jam them into a Navisworks or something like that. And you say, let's go ahead and let's generate our clashes. Great. Run it. You get 10,000 clashes. You wean out the obvious false positives. You maybe have 1,000 clashes. Awesome. Now what do you do? And that's where we said we need something there. Because what happens is, enter the BIM coordinate, okay, I'll send this clash to you and you, and can you guys please resolve it? And you walk away and do the next one. Like, oh, they didn't resolve it, can you please resolve it? And then did you resolve it? Did you have dialogue? And there's all of this banter around whether or not a clash has been looked at, resolved, and completed. So what the bot said was, okay, let me automate that dialogue. So, on the right here, we see BIM track. So if you're in the world of Navisworks and Revit, it's great, you're connected. You bring in the PM, the senior architect, and all these folk that probably have the answer. They're not gonna jump into that model, look at it, and they don't even know, right? So we give them a communication mechanism. So the bot uses something like Slack or Teams or one of those environments to engage in a dialogue on a channel focused on the clash, and it starts to ping and probe. And it says, hey, I know there's a clash. I know this is structural and architectural. I know the project, I know who the leads are, and I know this hasn't been resolved. And it just starts to drive you crazy in a very nice way, asking you to fix it. And then you start communication. So if I do an email, it ties it in and sees it. If I go to BIM track, it ties it in. So I don't, I'm assuming everyone knows BIM track, maybe that's bad. So BIM track is an add-on that focuses just on identifying clashes inside Navisworks or Revit, and then gives you a cloud environment to see them. So I could go to BIM track, the bot sees the dialogue, or I can just go to the chat mechanism and say, hey, I've looked at it, we're gonna fix it, and we go from there. So we made this marketing video, it was actually part of the CanBIM submission. We came in second for the award, and I'm proud of my second. I didn't win, it's all right. So part of the bot is, so this is our bot persona. So our marketing team jumped on board and said, hey, you know what, we want in on this. So they built this, um, and then for the BIM bot side, this is the concept. We're pinging this digital persona saying, you know, show me my clashes. And the concept is it'll just start to show me and I'll see them and I'll be able to ask for what I need, siphon through them, see what was resolved and what was not, have the quick history of the dialogue, declare it resolved if we finished it, and then most importantly, generate a report on all the clashes that have been looked at at a certain point of time, because in the wonderful world of DBP3 or maybe IPD, I'm gonna be asked, did you solve your clashes? Do you want to get paid? Let's see that you solved your clashes. And here is proof of the history of the dialogue and the parties. So it's fun stuff. We want to further automate. Okay, yeah, so we want to further automate this. So we focused just on the mitigation. So we said now, and we're working on this uh, slowly. I want to take, I want, I, want to just, I want to be able to say, here's where the Revits are. So BIM 360, server, project-wise, wherever. Here's Revit, here are my civil 3Ds, here's my whatever. Go, grab them, automatically generate clashes, automatically wean out what's incorrect or what's false positive, and portray everything to me in an automated fashion. So basically just do it. 
And every morning I'll get an update of clashes and then I'll be able to tie them through this BIM bot into a communication medium to those that have to resolve. And imagine the speed of that from a BIM coordinator to just say, just do it. And that's what we're working on it. And that, that my target is December, January. So I would love to show that next year. Algorithms, parametric design, bringing efficiency here to the front end. So long before I jump into Revit, well, let's do stuff. Here we're analyzing building form based on the potential to receive solar panels. And what would make sense? Where would be the most solar gain? What type of year? What happens if there's change in different buildings that come in front of it? And what's the relationship of the impact to solar gain if we put cells on the bottom concourse walls as well as the ceiling? Very simple, very quick. And when I think of algorithms, I say this. You don't need to know how to do it. You just need to know how to think it. That's all. Because for me, I've played with Grasshopper and Rhino, but I just don't have time. I'm just not, I know I'm not going to be the one. But if I say, you know what, can't we make a parameter for this, 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 and this? And I want to optimize this one. It'll be done. This happens quickly. This next one here, this is our interior designer. So what are your parameters? Desks, space between desks, size of the desks, uh, printer locations, and free space. That's about it. And then we, then the guy who did this showed, look, this is, these are all the sliders. This is how we play. You can twist them, rotate them, all that good stuff. But the trick was, now let's op optimize. We want to know what the perfect location is for all of these things that allow for the most amount of seats. And this will tell us. This does the work in conceptual design in minutes that would take an architect and interior design team I'm going to say weeks, definitely multiple days, but we could be in the weeks. There's my result. Then they said, well, let's, for a test, do printer locations. So where's the best spot to put a printer that has the least amount of travel distance from every single seat? And it goes through it. I can't do that. I don't even know how to do this if I had to do that by hand. By hand, by hand being even in a computer, even in Revit, by hand. So this goes off and does it. So imagine the power of this. You have this possibility. We, we see the top results. We save the ones we like. We go to the client. Does this make sense? This is the most amount of people we can fit based on your criteria. Client says, well, change the criteria. That's different. Or the client says, rock on and away we go. All of that done, we come back, jam that into Revit. I don't even care if it goes to, from Rhino to Revit smoothly or if I got to model that from scratch. It doesn't matter. The, the design concept is there, fixed, and perfect. And it has client buy-off with client understanding. So the knowledge seeker. So this one here, this is, okay, great. We have all this stuff. So now I've brought efficiencies in theory. The trick is people have to use all the stuff, but... There's dynamics there. So back to our bot. We said, okay, the first thing we're gonna do is let's, let's enhance this concept of the bot and use that to help connect to our infrastructure. So this is a couple of videos, of examples here, but this first one, okay, this is the marketing hoopla that they did, uh, kind of fun. So we actually had people on my team. We built 3D models of this bot. We did a design charrette. We named it Botaby. We had some interesting names. I proposed Brent. Nobody wanted that. I don't. I don't understand. Um, but yeah, I know. And, and you know, in our AGM, we announced the the persona, and then the concept is the capability. So this version of the this capability or persona is focusing on. I need a document. And, you know, some of these things, I like how it uses digital transfer agreement. It's one of those legal items where I'm going to give you my Revit, I'm going to give you my everything. I have data, it's at your disposal. But I'm going to include this little mini document just to remind you that, you know what? All that data, this is what I made it for. And if you need it for other things, please understand that this is all I made it for. So it's a good document. It's very... Uh, from a, a BIM in Canada perspective, we have the contract appendix. It references concepts of this. I just want to be careful because it's all about digital. It's all about, you know, there's liability. I'm a licensed architect, so I, I do want to be a little careful. Um, the other thing with our bot, we uh, said a knowledge zone. So that Revit loader I showed at the beginning, what if somebody just wants to know how to use it? Brent, you, you're giving me hell for not using it. I don't know what to do. 
So there's a bunch of our apps and we keep adding to this and they just click and it very quickly shows them just, this is what you do. This is why you do it, words, we put GIFs in, whatever. Point is just use it. So there's your data. And I could describe to them, you know what, you can go to the SharePoint site and here's a link and oh, I lost the link and it's just mind numbing. So now you just go to the bot and the bot will just tell you this is where it is. Um, bit of our VR now. So I'm gonna show a couple of, um, think of the experience. And this is what it's about. So it's not just a show of, hey, we can do VR, right? So here, 300, 360 degree imagery. The focus when we provide these, a lot of these for our interior clients, is to convey an understanding of space and experience. So once I have a model, once I have design data, it all comes together. This is just an avenue for an output. That's all this is. This is. So here it's about obviously spatial immersion and materiality immersion, but then we also build in connections and links and hyperlinks to other things and everything. But it's an avenue to bring the information together. And I think that's the important thing. Remember I started with cloud and 5G and everything. This is all in the cloud, right? I can read this live open environment, connecting and linking to information that if it's on the cloud, when I give this to my client, they see everything. And all that stuff is rendered. So I've got geniuses on my team that can render like that couch throw. I could never do that, but it's all good. Um, immersive experiences. I think I have a video here and let somebody else talk. There we go. Reality technologies are Technology that allows us uh, greater flexibility in terms of putting an audience within a digital environment. Virtual reality will surround a user wearing the headset in the digital world. Augmented reality will take a user's perspective and overlay computer-generated information on top of them and track it within the environment. Virtual reality is a really, really effective communication tool. It does such an amazing job of breaching the gap between the design and the client. We brought the client to IBI. We have engaged client to immerse the client into technology. They loved it and VR to really assist the client and assist design process in moving the project forward, particularly when it comes to the fundraising part of the um, client vision to uh, engage into um, a VR by playing basketball, by building a castle in real time. As a result, uh, we have uh, managed to fundraise uh, almost uh, two thirds of the money that we needed uh, at this uh, uh, point. Samsung was able to communicate what the new space was with their headquarters in Korea, and that helped everybody globally to understand what was going on at this particular location in Washington. It was a nice understanding for them when they were actually able to see their new home that they were going to and able to walk through the space and that really got them excited because it's one thing having an image and showing materials and things like that but once they were able to really experience and immerse themselves into the space they just loved it. As a technology driven design firm it's crucially important for us to stay at the forefront of technological advances in our industry. And I believe that VR is a game changer in terms of how we uh, design our uh, buildings and how we communicate them to our clients. So a lot of those examples, why, why I like playing that video, it's about conveying something to the user and an experience and that that school is one of my favorites not only was it geared towards a fundraising event but it was geared towards allowing the children to understand the experience that would that they would see when they're in that space now you know from the whole ecosystem of bim we modeled it we designed it we have that it all feeds into this and then we can story tell so obviously we didn't model the basketballs, we didn't model the building blocks, all of those things, but building those interactive components, the Samsung building, we knew there was gonna be a ceiling that had some technological something, that was in the model. The experience was built, we sat down, we went down to DC one day, we met 120 um, 
staff, and one by one they put the goggles on, and one by one they gave us whatever design feedback they had at the closing moments of that project. That was their only opportunity. Next time they saw the space, they were in the space. It was a fast-paced project. This one here, it showed it for a second. This is a dementia care home uh, for seniors in Edmonton. And the VR not only represents the space on the outside, but for, for um, inhabitants with cognitive and physical impairments, they strap on the goggle and they're given this as a task. Just go out there and light all the candles. So they go, they have to you know, bend, lift, turn around, see what's lit, see what's not, understand the, the control so they can hyperlink and move to the next, hyperlink, jump to the next, and fulfill a task. So they're thinking, they're moving, they're experiencing, and it's a portrayal of the landscape space that we designed in front of the building we designed. So there's a lot to this other than just VR my backyard, right? There's so much more that can happen. This is, a, for me, a very powerful one because, you know, when, when you watch society as they suffer for those when they're getting older, there's power here to say that something like this, you can actually make a true and honest difference at so many different levels. This one here, and I don't like the sound on this. Let's turn that off. This one here, uh, again, for seniors, the client said, I want an interactive virtual experience, but I don't want to strap my potential buyers into goggles. They're seniors. And we said, okay, we got the touch screen. So here they commissioned us to do all the renderings. We already had the model. We did the 360 imagery and it was about designing and fusing them all together. So this was using um, combinations of Unreal and Unity, bringing in stuff from Mac, stuff from Revit, stuff from everything. Um, so the, the concept is I'm a buyer, I'm selecting a suite. I wanna see where it is on that level. And then I have all of the imagery and the associated stuff to understand it, plus costing built in, et cetera. And client loved it. They sold their commission. We're, we're trying to get the close on three more commissions of the same. Um, putting my BIM professor hat on, it's always important to state that when you do stuff like this, it doesn't mean it comes included just because we're doing BIM. It's like one of the biggest myths I've fought all my career. BIM means I could do all of that. No, not even remotely. But you could do all of this taking stuff on that information continuum. Um, the next one I wanted to show, multi-user. We're, we're, we're um, experimenting heavily with trying to find the right platform of this. So I'm from Toronto, you're all from here, there's others in this room from Calgary, et cetera. Let's all put goggles on and let's all interact in the same space. So this was using a test environment provided by in, NVIDIA HoloLens, sorry, NVIDIA HoloDeck, sorry, not HoloLens, and um, we're experimenting with others as well. And this example, uh, the guy driving there is in Toronto, the person in the distance was in Vancouver, and then the third person I think was in our Calgary office. And seeing the same thing, so from a BIM perspective, it's a very simple model, right? Any, any of us can rev it that. Isolate that room, jam it into this holodeck com, um, cloud hosted experience. Now again, power of the cloud, power of 5G. The response was pretty good here with our regular networks. If this was 5G, it would have been phenomenal, right? And then it's a question of what do we want? What, what are all the actors? What are the assets? What are we gonna interact with? What does a client care about? This is an interiors client. If I'm in a water treatment plant, maybe here we're laying, up, laying out some pipes and valves. If I'm in a hospital, maybe we're laying out an operations room. Whatever the asset is, this capability is gonna become stronger and stronger. Again, seeking knowledge, being immersed into data and, and visual. This last one, my, my, one of my staff said, can we buy an Xbox gaming wheel? And I said, are you kidding me? But okay. So this building is a bus garage that we designed and we're now working with the agency to build a um, training regime. You can see the score kind of off the distance there um, to train about a thousand drivers on how to manipulate and use the new design. And we're trying to understand and, and, and yeah, we're trying to understand if they want us to score it. So if you bump into something, do, you, you know, do we want them to have a pass fail? How do we build this? 
but the technology is here. You see, they just drove in something there. This is the technology. And I remember when, when they asked me, and that's why I say surround yourself by awesome people. When they asked me, I just said, are you just trying to make me approve something really stupid I'm going to get in trouble with? But they made something real out of it. And it's pretty cool to say you can drive through your bin. Augmented reality, I've um, struggled in my career. So initially, when I would show this presentation, I would say, oh, cool, look, you can kind of put your model on the table and kind of see it with an iPad. And I'd say it with not too much enthusiasm. But we had an event last week, last month, sorry. So that's one of our 3D printed models, the surface of one of the stations of a transit, of one of our transit lines. Um, using AR, we did the site context and started to animate a bit of the stuff around. So here you can look at it with, a, with an iPad, with whatever. And, you know, I, all of a sudden I said to myself, you know what, I think I, I see a potential. So that was the site, and then we have the below ground. So every, the transit stations are amazing. You just see the little piece that sticks on top. You don't have an appreciation for all the stuff that's underneath. So this is actually showing how the train works, service versus public, et cetera. And all of it was basically grabbing the Revit model, which was pretty intense with this. Um, I don't want to say stripping it down, but making it um, a little less heavy so that it can go into the HoloLens and then making a manipulation and a story, right? And this was about, we're gonna be standing in front of people trying to wow them. What do we wanna tell them? What, what, what do we want them to, what do we want them to know that we can do with augmented reality? So that was one example. The other example is starting to bleed into what I described, you know, look at the lights and see the information. <coughs> Sorry, this one first. Let me mute that sound. This was shown on the table, and I'm just gonna fast forward to this part. Um, the idea of this was in Vancouver, somebody said, that's, my, that's the money shot for me. You can see the cars, the car, so it is real. The, the, the concept was, hey, we do all these projects. Can't we have a display of them, but have it all holographic? And I said, well, I don't know. So what they did is we have a projector in the ceiling, projecting on a mass white surface, a map of uh, Vancouver. And we could change the scale of it, uh, macro, micro, et cetera. And then we said, let's put markers in the map that calls upon the models of where we did our designs. So then using an iPad, depending on where you're focused, you're just going around and oh, there's an IBI design, there's an IBI design, and they use it for a client event. And I thought, you know, it's kind of cool, kind of, you know, the first comment was, well, we do BIM, Brent. Can't BIM do that? Well, no, but so, you know, let's plan for this and make it happen. And that was an example of something we do. Again, it's like, it's augmented reality. Oh, I didn't show the other one, sorry. So we're, we're working more and more on the pointing. So at that event last month, we started putting barcodes on the wall. And we just said, take your phones and start to point at those barcodes. And it would just show you some data. That's all. So a little bit of data on what you're pointing at. And for me, that excited me. It was fictitious. So we just had it showing data from a central server somewhere. But that's the concept. It's showing information about what you're seeing drawn from somewhere. So that the more and more that comes, uh, you know, the visions that are going all crazy in my head will actually come to reality. Live data tracking. So this is Brent being big brother, but my CEO loves it. So we... Um, <laughs> basically said, you know what, all of these things we've built, we've got to track to see if we're using it. So I, I built a formula saying, if I'm bringing savings, I'm preventing additional useless clicks. Every click is worth money, saving seconds. Seconds equals time, time equals money. Every time you use one of our Revit tools or our general tools, we track it, and then we report on it using Power BI. If you haven't used Power BI, Power BI is phenomenal. It is like, for me, it's, it's the gift of everything for information, okay? So I've tracked this. This thing's been running since March 12th. That number 28K just passed 195 this morning. So it's awesome. It's tracking everybody's usage. Does everybody know Power BI? Oh my God, it comes with Microsoft. It's so phenomenal. So picture this. If I said to you, look at Revit just as data, right? You can go to Revit, file, export, hit that thing called ODBC, and shoot it to a SQL server. 
That's it. It just takes all your raw data, leaves the geometry behind. Then I take that raw data, I jam it into Power BI, and I make pretty pictures. And it's beautiful. I can compare, I can understand, I can graph. You can do so much with Power BI with any source of data. And it's just a beautiful thing. I only discovered it in February, and I'm, I feel like such a geek because I'm so excited by it, and I do crazy stuff. It's so good. Last three, and then I promise I'm done. So when I started IBI, my CEO said, you talk a good BIM story. Can't you do something better with it? I'm like, oh, that hurts. That, that's rough. So he said, hey, we have an asset management system down in Florida. We use it for toll systems. So our intelligence team, they design tolls. You know, miles upon miles of roadway, there's a toll at different locations. They've got to manage it. Um, it might need regular maintenance. A uh, passerby might say there's trouble with it, et cetera. Then he goes, Brent, that's there. Make it work with BIM. And I said, oh, okay. So, we, so I said, we can do it. So the power of IFC, open BIM format, jamming it into the system, and what I call gluing streams of data together. So this is about making things work. You all know in your Revit, every single thing you drop in Revit has a unique identifier. So it's good, everything's unique. In the world, everything we design is gonna be somewhere. So the Revit unique identifier, plus the fact that it's somewhere geospatial, put a QR code on it, so I can now scan it. So Revit GUID, QR code, spatial, and then there's an asset record. And the asset record's important because I am a firm believer that I don't wanna jam the big bucket of Revit full of stuff that I don't need in Revit. So everything's in my asset management system, tied to the GUID through the QR code, I don't know where it is in the world, and then I got this. This won first place in the te technology award at CanBIM two years ago. So what we'll show here, log into the system. This is our head office at, uh, in Toronto. And um, we have the ability to dashboard using Power BI metrics. So any data that's there dividing for us space usage by department, et cetera, we know where we are. So we're geospatially located. And I then have the, what am I doing here? Just showing the system. Okay, facilities. I can now drill into our building and separate it by floors or whatever it is. So this is our main campus, ninth floor. Bring up a 2D viewer, space management. People are assets. We are probably the most important assets some firms have. So we're able to manage our spaces. Spaces straight from Revit through that GUID, jammed into the system, assigned an asset. You see what furniture is in the space. If you use the Rufus or one of those tools, they all complement each other. We built in an open BIM 3D viewer, so it reads the IFC file. And again, you can see the spaces are there to be selected. So again, they're just 3D representation of Revit spaces. Or I can go to asset view and start identifying or interacting with components. And then it shows me the components. So all the BIM infused in, all the asset data, um, maintenance history, warranty, am I leasing it? What am I paying? Is it located? Does it have repair tickets? All of those good stuff. If I'm traditional, there's my wonderful list of assets, search, and I can pull up the record and see where it is. I also have the app. I can do the QR codes and find it. And then lastly, a trouble ticket. There's a problem with the asset. The microwave doesn't work. The TV's broken. Well, what am I gonna do? Email some fictitious person in our email and hopefully something happens? No, I'm gonna tie it straight to the asset. This is an issue. It gets assigned to a person. It's all trackable, it's all there. The social interactions of our assets are tracked and built into the system, thus allowing us to report literally on anything. It's all there. So notice I kept referencing the social. It's all about bringing information to the people, okay? The users, the stakeholders. So this here fuses together streams of data from BIM, from asset management, the maintenance side. Through BIM, you get access to your shop drawings and all the stuff that ha that's pertinent to that asset. This is all in the building. Now I'm gonna step back and enter the world of smart city. One of the other overused phrases of the you know, last 10 years, it's all good. So, smart city platform by IBI. 
is that she talks a lot slower than me, so you can read what she's saying. But the idea of the smart city platform is to basically say, okay, now outside of the building, so all that stuff I just so showed is one piece of data, one massive data source. Now we have all these others. You're in the existing infrastructure of your urban fabric. Your building is going to talk to everything here. And then everything here interacts with wider networks. So I always say, if you think your Revit building floats, tell me how you do it, because it doesn't. And once it's in that ground, it's infused to everything. IoT sensoring. IoT sensors are in our water and wastewater treatment plants. They're everywhere. So there's all that data. And then we want to make an engagement app. So once you have all that data, the resident needs to engage with portions of the information that's pertinent to them connecting them to that. And then our smart city platform basically makes a viewer into all that. And we say, come to this platform and we'll give you a set of analytics based on what you need. So big data, purpose fit. This is what I need to know about. And this is how I visualize the data. Do I need to be immersed in it? Again, AR, right? Right back to look at the lights. How do I connect to the world of the big data? This platform is active on 15 different cities right now in various forms. So we call it smart city, smart city, think smart campus. U of R here, this could have a smart city platform. There's multiple buildings, multiple interactions, community engagement and connection to the mass city at large. I assume this would be an awesome spot for this platform. And then lastly, that user engagement. With all of this, all of the sources of data that exist, the most important source is you and I. So it's the human factor. So how do we ensure that the human factor is accounted for and not forgotten? So we, we initially called it tenant experience app, user experience app, whatever it is. If I'm talking in the world of a condominium, in the world of a university, a resident, a hotel, whatever it is, how do I engage us as the stakeholders of the data to not only see it, interpret it, harness and benefit from it, but also feedback as an additional source and the most important source of information. And that's the entry point here. So they, with this app, they have various um, things they can connect to. So if there's an issue, they want to book facilities, whether it's you know, obviously university facilities, facilities in a condo, et cetera, all tied, the visualization aspect of it tied to that digital twin, that digital twin sourced by the design BIM and that entire growth of the BIM throughout the supply chain of the project. Now, I always say, is, you know, look, think of LODs. Is it the 300 model, the 350, the 400, the combination of it all? Is it the whole thing? jammed together, something purpose fit? I don't know. There's no right or wrong answer. And LODs for me are a whole different dialogue, but the information is there. And there's a lot of information and that's just the BIM. Everything else comes together here. This community engagement, we, um, we, we just acquired a firm called Aspire that built uh, a community engagement portals in Coquitlam, BC. Basically, they're just like digital stands scattered across the city where people come up to them and they start to engage on information pertinent to how they can engage with city events. Pretty phenomenal stuff. Uh, access control to buildings, to software, to components, to whatever it is. So. You know, with all of that, I won't dwell, probably have dwelled, last slide here. So for us, you know, what does IBI do? And this is basically I've given you a, a brief, because imagine this presentation being three times as long, and then I wean it down to just show a couple examples. Smart design and data-driven design. Our, the president of our firm said, we don't design buildings and spaces, we design data. And I love that. Because I said, wow, you're like that. You basically just said it's all about the eye of BIM without using those terms. So, but we design data. And from that data comes our models, comes our drawings, comes all that stuff. That's what we design. And that's as an industry, that's what we do. For me, tools that work, that's why I started with, you know, the general user. I still got to open my software. And I always say, if Revit doesn't print, they're gonna come to me and complain and say the whole BIM process is terrible because this one drawing, the, the line weights are bad. And I, yeah, we'll, we'll fix that. The human experience, the human factor, we can't lose that when we get all this automation, robotic processes, connection to data, connection to technology, it is all still for the benefit of us. The robots will not take control. I love Terminator franchise. 
That's cool, but the robots will not take control. We're the driving seat. When people say to me, with all this automation, will I lose my job? No, your job will become more awesome. And that, there's no other way to say that. Anybody who says there, I would much rather be sitting in Revit saying right-click new, right-click new, punching in the level 15, 20, 30, 80 times. Who would want to do that? So we make things better and we introduce new. So I mentioned Power BI. We actually have a brand new team of about three to four people on the corporate side that are all about data manipulation, making Power BI dashboards so we can track our stat, like oh, amazing stuff. And I come along saying, oh, look, I can jam Revit into Power BI too. Look at that data. There's a whole new facet of data manipulation and mining and, 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 and analyzing power is there. And it's hopefully to inspire. Because again, it's about the people. If anything I said has an element of inspiration to it, awesome. If you guys think I'm nuts, great. That's cool too. I'm good with all of that. And that's all I had.